So Fotis was making us make timelines. Of that day. I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. We're at day 15 in the Missing Mom murder trial, arguably around halfway. What do we know about the case against the mistress at this point? Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Also, I'll be, I am doing live recaps pretty much every day. So if you haven't subscribed, please do hit the notification bell. If you're enjoying this analysis, I think if you're confused about the case, if you don't understand the case, this should clarify a lot at the halfway point. If it does clarify something, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. Number one, evidence drop. This is probably the most important and memorable and significant piece of evidence against the mistress. You know, they say a picture says a thousand words, and this one certainly does that. In this one image, we see Michelle Traconis with the murderer on the day of the murder, and she's right there where evidence is being disposed. You don't see that every day. A few seconds later, photos would saunter over and deposit two license plates that had been altered, folded up in a FedEx envelope, right under her nose. He would slot that into the drain. That's right where she is. Number two, alibi scripts. If Mistress Mishi's credibility is strained by her proximity to the crime in that CCTV of her apparently putting gum off the sidewalk, if her, prox if her credibility is strained by proximity to the crime, to the criminal, and to the evidence on the night of May 24th, the fact that she participated in a three-page alibi script which excluded the evidence drop as part of the timeline, that is something that I dealt with in that clip right at the beginning of this episode. Well, the evidence drop now begins to strengthen You know, the, this idea that she didn't merely possibly have some guilty knowledge, but that she probably did. Now, if we look at these images it's first of all of the mudroom and then zooming in on the bag that contained photocopies. Did you know that the original alibi script was found in a trash bin in the four group office? That was also, I guess, an attempt to get rid of those documents. The alibi script wasn't simply hypothetical either. It wasn't as though they wrote something down and then discarded it and didn't use it. It was this narrative that Mishi used, that's Michelle Traconis, the mistress, used or relied on during her first interrogation with law enforcement. And the whole idea was to have consistency between what she said and what photos said in terms of their movements, where they were at a particular time. The affidavit for Michelle Traconis notes that Mishi's original version of her whereabouts were quote-unquote nearly verbatim when compared to the alibi script. When confronted with, it, with evidence, Traconis changed her statements about where and when um, she was, where she was and when she was in a particular place. That was in two subsequent interviews. Number three, Mishi's DNA is present in crime scene evidence. Now, it may, have, may seem up until this point that Michelle Traconis is, there's no evidence of her anywhere in the fabric of the crime scene. Well, until you deal with the DNA. So none of the mistress's fingerprints are present. That's true. Just one print was recovered from Fotis, even though he seemed to throw away garbage bags with ungloved hands. That's quite interesting. When you look at the footage, he seems to be throwing away garbage without gloves on his hands. But two vital DNA evidence items suggest that Mishi participated in some way in the disposal. One DNA sample is found with, it's not just the fact that Mishi's DNA is present. It's the fact that Jennifer's DNA and Fotis' DNA 
are present in the same context. That's huge. That's huge. And then there's another sample that is found with just Jennifer's DNA. So Michelle Traconis' DNA and Jennifer's DNA. Now, you've also got to ask yourself, what proper reason did Fotis and Michelle have to be dumping garbage collected in the morning more than 70 miles away somewhere else that same evening? Have you ever d dumped garbage 70 miles from where you live? Not just one garbage disposal, but multiple. Have you ever done that? Interestingly, Michi said in some of her statements that Fotis returned to the office sometime in the morning when his phone places him in Farmington from 9 a.m. until 1.33 p.m., that would seem to me to be a good target area to look for human remains. Number four, Mishi's associated with the red Toyota Tacoma as well. It's already quite serious, the fact that Mishi is in the Black Raptor with photos when she, you know, when she is where she is and doing whatever she was doing. But there's evidence that Mishi had something to do with Pavel Gumeni's red Toyota Tacoma as well. That vehicle is important as it appears to have been used in the final leg of transporting and ultimately hiding away Jennifer Dulos's body. Mishi also described in some detail an advanced cleaning operation that took place and one that she participated in. While I'm not clear exactly what the date of that was, it involved coffee being spilled and cleaned up from a particular vehicle. That was her narrative. Well, can you guess which vehicle had this coffee spill in it that required this big cleaning operation? Well, in her own words, she said, I believe it was in the Tacoma, right? Investigators asked her where Dulos was cleaning the coffee stains, and she said, I believe it was in the Tacoma. And then five days later, Fotis and Michi conspired to clean the Tacoma together. Why was the Tacoma used in the first place? Well, likely to transport Jennifer's body to its final resting place. How do we know? Well, besides CCTV, Jennifer's blood was found to be on the passenger side, the passenger seat of the vehicle. Why did Fotis and Michi go to so much trouble to clean the Tacoma, specifically to swap out the seats? Well, pro possibly because Jennifer's blood evidence could be found there. Another reason that Tacoma was used was possibly to confuse the evidence trail and who it led back to. Interestingly, Mishi's contact number is also written on the Russell Speeder's car wash receipt, besides phone records placing her at the car wash herself. Number five, timing of the incident and Mishi's daughter. On the day of the incident, Mishi's daughter Nicole was busy with a recital until around 9 p.m. I'm not sure if it was a recital, but it was something to do with her school. And that was unusual. She was usually home, I think, around 3 p.m. So was Fotis aware of the recital of the school event and that Mishi's daughter wouldn't be around that whole day? Was Mishi aware of it and that her daughter wouldn't be around th that whole day? Number six, motive. Michelle Draconis' defense lawyer said that there isn't a motive because Fotis was winning the divorce battle at the time Jennifer disappeared. He means that Fotis was likely to get joint custody at that time. But I don't think the motive was simply about custody, although custody is relevant, but perhaps not in a way that you might think. If Jennifer died, her children would inherit an amount collectively of around $2 million dollars. If Fotis then gained custody of the children, he would have access of a sort to that money. He certainly probably imagined that he would. And he was in serious financial difficulty at the time of the murders. Just the civil divorce proceedings, listen to this, just the civil divorce proceedings over a period of two years, it cost him an estimated two and a half million dollars. His total debts on May 31st were around seven million, so around 4.5 million in addition to that. In March, about three months before Jennifer's murder, Fotis stopped making interest payments on a major loan of half a million dollars to the People's United Bank. Now, I do think the financial narrative is an important narrative all of its own, probably one we should deal with separately. Number seven, a second co-conspirator. Mishi is accused of conspiring with Fotis, but she's not the only one. Kent Mawini's name also appeared on the alibi scripts. There's also a third accessory 
although Pavel Gumeni appears to be an unknown, uh, unknowing accessory, possibly set up to be the fall guy. In a situation where Fotis is a controlling, manipulative, greedy individual with several employees working for him, and even his girlfriend was, in a sense, an employee, she was a member of staff of sorts, someone who worked for and at the four group. She did marketing for him. One can imagine in a high-stakes situation like this, with so much money on the line that more than one individual may have been prepared to be recruited into his scheme. And then the eighth and final point, length of the relationship. I've spoken about this previously in some of the live stream coverage that I've done. The likelihood that a mistress might conspire to commit murder is connected to her commitment. In most relationships, commitment increases over time. Michi had been in a serious relationship with Fotis for at least two years, possibly even longer. Plenty of time for that commitment to uh, lock in. She lived with the accused, her daughter lived with the accused, and his nightmare was her nightmare. His, his two years of torture during an extremely acrimonious divorce was torture for her as well, and she said as much. Part of that torture, that, that humiliation, was that on each weekend when Fotis got custody of the Duda's children, Michi and her child had to move out. They had to find somewhere else to stay. It's likely, think about that, it's your home, and that what you think of as your home, and every time your rival's kids come over, you've got to go out and stay in a hotel or a Airbnb for the weekend. It's likely this was a source of tremendous bitterness and contempt and even hatred um, for the mistress or from the mistress's side. It's also worth noting the length of the relationship after the incident. It continued for an incredible five months, despite increasingly obvious signs that Fotis had murdered his wife. Think about Nicole Kessinger was only with Chris Watts really a day, maybe two days after she found out what had happened. And in the same way Fotis treated his wife like a disposable object, he seemed to dispose of Mishi and moved on to the, move on to the next girlfriend. In the end, he even seemed to regard his own life as disposable. Well, that is the legacy of money. If money becomes more important than life, then life becomes something that can be bought, sold, or flushed away. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.